My name is Michael Corwin and I'm at the University of California, Davis, and today I'll be discussing imaging of the adrenal glands. The outline for today's talk, first we're going to discuss imaging techniques focusing on CT and MRI, then discuss the imaging appearance of common adrenal lesions, and lastly focus on the management of incidental adrenal nodules. So let's start off with the CT protocol. First, we perform an unenhanced CT through the upper abdomen to include the adrenal glands. And then the radiologist should be called to check the scan. If there's no nodule and the adrenal glands appear normal, the exam can be stopped at that point. If there is a nodule, measuring less than 10 Hounsman units, the exam can also be stopped. However, if there's a nodule measuring greater than 10 Hounsman units, the contrast portion of the exam should be completed at that time. One note about technique, the slice thickness should be around three millimeters or less to avoid volume averaging when placing ROIs. So if you are to give contrast, you'll do two post-contrast phases, one at roughly 60 to 75 seconds, and a second delay at 15 minutes. This will allow for the absolute and relative washouts to be calculated. When placing your ROI, it should cover approximately two-thirds of the nodule centered in the middle and again avoiding any volume averaging. The absolute washout is calculated by taking the post contrast, which is defined as the 60 to, second, 60 to 75 second delay, minus the 15 minute delayed, divided by the post minus the pre-contrast. Relative washout removes the need for the pre-contrast and takes post minus delayed over the post contrast. Let's discuss MRI. The mainstay of MRI imaging of the adrenal glands is chemical shift imaging. In brief, the in phase is acquired when fat and water protons are precessing in phase and the signal is additive. The out of phase is acquired when fat and water protons are 180 degrees opposed phase and therefore the signal will cancel. Therefore, any tissue that has both fat and water protons in it will get darker on the out of phase compared to the in phase. And this will allow for the assessment of both macroscopic and microscopic fat. Okay, so let's discuss the most common adrenal lesion, which is adrenal adenomas. About five to 10% are functional, most secreting cortisol, and more rarely aldosterone. The imaging features, they are usually small, less than 4 centimeters, usually homogeneous, well circumscribed, and the key feature is the presence of intratumoral lipid. So on CT, on non-contrast CT, adenomas will measure less than 10 Hounsman units in about two-thirds of cases, and these are so-called lipid-rich adenomas. And this is, of course, because the presence of fat lowers the attenuation of the nodule such that it's less than 10. However, in one-third of cases, the attenuation is greater than 10 Hounsman units, and these are so-called lipid-poor adenomas. This is an example. We would place our ROI, we get three Hounsman units, and we can be confident that this is a lipid-rich adenoma. Now, for those lesions that measure greater than 10, we can perform washout CT, and it turns out that adenomas demonstrate rapid washout of IV contrast. Therefore, a absolute washout of greater than 60% or relative washout greater than 40% has moderate to high sensitivity and high specificity. However, note that these numbers are not 100% and there are important exceptions to these rules, which we will discuss later. Moving on to MRI, adenomas generally have low or intermediate signal and T2 weighted images. Loss of signal or dropout on out of phase images compared to the in phase is the key feature in diagnosing lipid-rich adenomas, again, because of that microscopic fat. Now, it's important to note that this feature has a higher sensitivity for intratumoral lipid than the 10 Hounsman unit threshold on CT. And therefore, MRI may be useful in cases where the unenhanced CT is just above 10 or 10 to 30 Hounsman units. Now, how can you assess whether there's loss of signal on out-of-phase imaging? Well, most commonly we do this subjectively and it's easy to appreciate that the lesion is getting darker on the out of phase. However, if you're unclear looking at it subjectively, there are ways that you can calculate 
the chemical shift ratio or the signal intensity index. And there are online calculators that can help you with this if you need to do this. This is an example. We see in the right adrenal gland, there's a small nodule that shows clear loss of signal on the out of phase image on your right. And this is consistent with the lipid ridge adenoma. So let's discuss some atypical imaging features of adrenal adenomas. Rarely, they can have a heterogeneous appearance, including cystic changes, necrosis, calcifications, or hemorrhage. This occurs in larger lesions. Rarely, they can also have small foci of macroscopic fat. We will discuss this in detail in a little bit. And what about growth? Well, it turns out that adenomas can grow. Roughly one-third of them grow. However, they grow quite slowly in general, on average about one millimeter a year and should be less than two to three millimeters a year. So it's important to remember that atypical imaging features should raise suspicion for malignancy. However, given the high prevalence of adenomas, a nodule with these findings may still be an adenoma in the absence of risk factors for malignancy. And this is the, the classic saying that atypical features of common lesions may be more common than typical features of rare tumors. Moving on to adrenal myelolipomas. These are benign tumors comprised of fat and hematopoietic tissue. They comprise 6% of incidental adrenal masses. They are non-functional and generally asymptomatic unless they're mass, large enough to have mass effect and really they can hemorrhage. Gross fat is the characteristic imaging feature and any adrenal mass that is largely comprised of fat or greater than 50% fat is essentially diagnostic of a myelolipoma. They may have variable amounts of soft tissue density and they can calcify. So let's discuss the macroscopic fat containing adrenal mass further. This is a paper from 1998 that looked at CT of quote unquote myelolipomas based on the presence of gross fat on CT and they looked at the pathology. It turns out that most true myelolipomas had greater than 50% fat in the lesion, but importantly, they had 18 non-myelolipoma lesions with gross fat. And it turns out that these were adenomas with myelolipomas or lipomatous change within them. And importantly, all but two of these had less than 50% fat. So the conclusion from that study was that an adrenal mass with small amounts of fat could still be a myelolipoma, but it can also be an adenoma with fatty degeneration. Now, why does this matter? Because they're both benign. Well, an adrenal adenoma should have a biochemical evaluation because it may be functioning, whereas a myelolipoma should not be. It's also important to note that rarely adrenal cortical carcinoma can have gross fat. This is usually not a diagnostic dilemma because these are otherwise large, aggressive appearing tumors, however. This is a case of a proven adrenal adenoma that in 2009 was entirely soft tissue density. However, the patient came back for a CT for an unrelated reason seven years later and had developed a small focus of macroscopic fat within the tumor. Moving on to adrenal pheochromocytomas. These have been termed the imaging chameleon due to the wide variety of their appearance. But the typical features would include a hyperenhancing tumor that's heterogeneous, may have cystic components, calcifications are possible, and the classic feature on MRI is the light bulb appearance on T2 weighted imaging. However, it's important to note that this is not always seen. Important to know that about one third of FIOs can meet washout criteria. So as we discussed earlier, that specificity of washout is not 100%, and this is one important reason why. Very rarely there are reports where FIOs can contain microscopic or macroscopic fat, but that is a very unusual feature. Quickly discuss the syndromes associated with pheochromocytoma. These are important to remember, and they include von Hippel-Lindau, MEN type 2, as well as neurofibrom neurofibromatosis type 1. This is an example of a patient with bilateral adrenal nodules. These are pheochromocytomas, and you can see the nodule on the left has some cystic change. It does have that T2 light bulb bright appearance. And we can look at the skin in this patient on the CT. We can see multiple skin nodules. This is a 
patient with NF1 who has bilateral theochromocytomas. Here's a right adrenal nodule, and I'll show you the attenuation values on the different phases. So we have the non-contrast on your left, the early post-contrast in the middle, and the 15-minute delay on the right. And the calculated absolute washout is greater than 60%, so this does meet washout criteria. But as I mentioned, pheochromocytoma can wash out, again, in about one-third of cases. Now, it's also important to pay attention to the absolute attenuation values, not just the washout, because it has been shown that if the early post-contrast attenuation is greater than 130 Hounsfield units, you need to suspect pheochromocytoma, even if it does wash out. So moving on to adrenal cortical carcinoma, fortunately this is a rare tumor, however it is quite aggressive. It is functional in about 60% of cases, and metastases commonly go to liver, lung, and bone. We can see in this example we have a large heterogeneous partially necrotic tumor with some areas of calcifications. Now on imaging, usually they are quite large, again heterogeneous enhancement, often with necrosis and hemorrhage. This is an example where we can see a large mass that has a necrotic center, peripheral enhancement, and layering hemorrhage both in the tumor and into the retroperitoneum. Uh, it can calcify, as we just saw. Margins are irregular and commonly will have local invasion into the renal veins as well as the IVC. Again, as I mentioned earlier, rarely can contain macroscopic fat and rarely can wash out. Adrenal metastases are quite common, and the common primaries include lung, breast, thyroid, RCC, melanoma, and colon, among others. In a patient with a known primary malignancy, about 50 to 75% of adrenal ma masses are metastases, and that's simply because adenomas are so common, often bilateral. And the imaging features are nonspecific, but it's very important to keep in mind the imaging features of your primary tumor. And this is an example why, because metastases to the adrenal can have microscopic fat, in particular RCC and HCC, because of course RCC and HCC primary tumors can have microscopic fat. It's also important to know that hypervascular metastases can wash out. Again, RCC and HCC, because those are hypervascular. Briefly, I want to mention the phenomenon of adrenal collision tumor. This is defined as the coexistence of two distinct tumors in the same gland. This is an example where we have a low attenuation nodule in the left adrenal gland. If you were to put your attenuation value here, we would have less than 10. However, you note that there is a soft tissue component in the superior portion of this nodule, and this turned out to be a lung cancer metastasis to an adrenal adenoma. So this is termed a collision tumor. Adrenal lymphoma, uh, primary adrenal lymphoma is rare, so it's usually secondary involvement in patients with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, usually we're going to see a homogeneous soft tissue mass. This is a patient who has lymphoma of both the liver, and you can see bilateral masses and enlargement of the adrenal glands. It can also be engulfed by retroperitoneal lymphoma, as in this example. We should not have any calcification unless the patient's been treated, and we will not have any fat or wash out. Let's discuss adrenal hemorrhage. This can be traumatic, in which case the right is more common than the left. It can be spontaneous related to stress or anticoagulation. And it's important to note that if we have bilateral adrenal hemorrhage, the patient can undergo adrenal insufficiency or adrenal crisis. So it's very important to notify our clinicians of that. You can have hemorrhage within a tumor. We saw the case of the adrenal cortical carcinoma that hemorrhaged. And if it's just pure hemorrhage, it will be bright uh, on CT, depending on the stage. It will be non-enhancing. And in the chronic phase, it can form a pseudocyst with peripheral calcifications. But it's important to make sure that there's no underlying tumor. So you may need to get a follow-up to ensure resolution and that there is no underlying mass. Briefly, let's discuss adrenal cysts. As we just mentioned, we can have pseudocysts from prior hemorrhage or trauma, as in this example, we have a cystic lesion with some peripheral calcifications, which is typical. True cysts are possible, though rare. They can be either epithelial or endothelial. We can have infections, such as a chinococcus. And as we mentioned, some tumors can be cystic. Usually, you'll have a more 
complex cysts with solid components or thickened wall. There are some case reports of purely cystic pheochromocytomas, but in my experience, usually you'll, you'll at least have some thick enhancing wall to these lesions. This is an example of a pure cyst here. This was resected uh, based on its size and it was symptomatic and it turned out to be a benign endothelial cyst. Macronodular adrenal hyperplasia is a rare entity, but it's interesting. These patients have bilateral adrenal enlargement with multiple discrete nodules. It can be either lipid rich or lipid poor, and it's a rare cause of both subclinical Cushing syndrome as well as Cushing syndrome. And you can see in this example, there are innumerable bilateral adrenal nodules. And on the pathology specimen, you can see that the adrenal gland is just riddled with these nodules. Okay, so let's move on to our next topic. And we're going to start with a case. Here's a typical example. You have a 61-year-old man who presents to your ER with abdominal pain. He's got no history of cancer and you have no prior imaging. What you see in the left adrenal gland is a small nodule measuring 32 Hounsman units. So you're left with an indeterminate incidental nodule measuring 2.4 centimeters in a patient without cancer. So how do we manage it? Let's discuss the incidental adrenal nodule. These occur in about 5% of adults. We know that most are benign adenomas, however, may be indistinguishable from the rare malignancy, particularly on a single phase contrast enhanced CT. And the appropriate management remains controversial. So let's discuss a couple papers. This was published about 10 years ago in AJR from Julie Song, and she looked at over 1,000 consecutive adrenal masses in patients without a history of cancer. And they found zero cases of malignancy. As we would expect, most of the lesions were adenomas, a few myelolipomas and hematomas, and also a few pheochromocytomas. Now, from the same data set, they specifically looked at the incidental indeterminate adrenal mass, again measuring greater than 10 Hounsman units, in patients without cancer. So they had 321 consecutive masses, and again, no cases of malignancy were found. So this data suggests that the incidental indeterminate adrenal mass is highly likely to be benign. So fast forward to the 2017 white paper. First off, what we can see is if we have diagnostic benign imaging features, so for example, a mass that is almost entirely macroscopic fat, we can diagnose a myelolipoma and be done. A simple cyst would be another example. We also know that if we have an indeterminate mass and it measures greater than four centimeters, we're gonna recommend surgical consultation simply because the risk of malignancy is higher in lesions of this size. If we have prior imaging, and the mass is stable for one year or greater, we can consider this to be benign. However, if it's new or enlarging, we are going to be suspicious from malignancy and get a further workup. But now I want to discuss the most common scenario when you have an indeterminate nodule between one and four centimeters in a patient with no history of cancer and you have no prior studies. 2017 white paper says if it's two, one to two centimeters, it's likely to be benign and they give you the option to follow it up with an adrenal protocol CT in 12 months. Going back to our algorithm, if we take the same lesion, but it's larger, measuring two to four centimeters, an adrenal protocol CT is recommended at that time. And this is simply based on the fact that nodule size correlates with the risk of malignancy. Briefly, I just wanna show you that there are a wide variety of additional guidelines from our clinical colleagues uh, consensus statements, uh, and societal guidelines. And just note that you can see every single guideline does recommend some degree of imaging follow-up for all incidental adrenal nodules. What about performing a biochemical evaluation? As we mentioned, most adrenal incidental lomas are non-functioning. However, 5-10% of these patients can have early or subclinical Cushing syndrome. Now these are patients who don't have overt evidence of Cushing syndrome, but do have small levels of cortisol hypersecretion. And it's important because these patients are at risk for hypertension, obesity, insulin resistance, dyslipidemia, and osteoporosis. So we do want to identify these patients. More rarely, we can have a pheochromocytoma or aldosteronoma. So basically, 
hormonal evaluation is recommended for all adrenal incidentalomas um, pretty much by any societal guideline. And the 2017 ACR white paper uh, refers to those other guidelines. So let's summarize our approach to the incidental uh, adrenal nodule. If we have a lesion that has greater than 50% gross fat, we can call this a myelolipoma with confidence and no further workup is needed. If we have a soft tissue nodule that has small focal areas of fat, this could be a myelolipoma, but it could also be an adenoma, and this is important because a functional workup is probably indicated. If the nodule measures less than 10 Hounds units on a non-contrast CT, this is consistent with a lipid-rich adenoma, and a functional workup is recommended. If we happen to have a washout study, greater than 60% absolute or 40% relative washout is going to be likely an adenoma, and a functional workup is indicated. However, as we mentioned, there are important exceptions, such as pheochromocytomas, so pay attention to that early phase attenuation of greater than 130, and make sure the patient doesn't have a history of hypervascular malignancy, such as RCC or HCC. If the nodule is indeterminate and measures 1 to 2 centimeters, it's highly likely to be benign, a functional workup is indicated, and a one-year follow-up CT can be considered, although this is somewhat controversial. If it's indeterminate, measuring 2 to 4 centimeters, again, it's still likely benign, and a functional workup is indicated, but an adrenal protocol CT can be performed simply because of the size. And if we have an indeterminate nodule measuring greater than 4 centimeters, we'll recommend a surgical consultation. So in conclusion, most adrenal nodules can be accurately characterized by imaging. However, there are important exceptions to these rules with significant overlap between benign and malignant masses. And indeterminate adrenal nodules are highly likely to be benign, although the follow-up protocol does remain controversial. Thank you.